Welcome to A Problem Squared, the problem-solving podcast where people send in their problems, we try and solve them, and I would say we are always on point. You occasionally get double or triple the value you're expecting, and even when we veer off course, it's still pretty exciting. Darts. Darts-themed intro. Oh, Thank you. nice. Thank you. Do you want to hear the three I rejected? Yes. Uh, people often enjoy the podcast while drinking beer. Yeah. The main event is surrounded by a bunch of numbers. Okay, yep. And uh, occasionally things get dinged. Oh, nice. That yeah. Was, yeah that didn't, when you hit I the wrong thing. I didn't format those properly. That was the... Mine would be, it can sometimes be a sharp jab in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> As in like a pain in the butt. Wow. Wow. Well, I was going to say, it's a podcast of two players. Beck Hill, comedian, TV presenter. Very sharp. Occasionally decorated oh. with feathers. Okay. <laughs> You can't Are you referring to my flights? Well, uh, y- yes, yes. And I'm almost certain at some point you've had feathers. In darts them. don't have feathers. Arrows do. Well, it does and have they're called feathers fletchers. on the back. What have they got on the back of them? No, not called fletchers, are they? Fletcher is someone who fletchers, makes arrows. Yeah. So I think maybe they're called a flight on an arrow as but well. But they must have been on a dart. They've got the Well, they're, pla- the they're plastic. Oh, I don't know if, if darts had feathers. Darts. In the same way that I'm on the podcast that causes more problems. There we are. Yeah, exactly. We are halfway through the intro. We've already caused our own <laughs> problem. And I'm Matt Parker, mathematician, author, and a surprising amount of arithmetic for something that's advertised as fun and entertaining. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I you like go. that. Yeah. Bullseye. <laughs> on this episode, I'll be looking at different ways to shelve books. I've comprehensively run the numbers on the German lottery. And we've got a lot of any other business. Including the fact that producer Lauren has just found out darts used to be made with turkey feathers. Yes, in the 19th century. There you go. Just there like you. you. Oh. All right, back where, uh, back in the UK. And how are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I've, I've been very busy. You have been busy. Yeah. I'm doing a, a bunch of stuff. Yeah, you flew home uh-huh. two days after we recorded the USA episode. Yes, that was fun, by the way. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that immensely. Yeah. And also, I want to give a shout out to the people who came to an evening of unnecessary detail in New York who were a Problem Squared fan. Yes, it was very nice to meet a bunch of you. Thank you for coming along. Yeah, we had a couple of ding shirts in the audience. Ding shirts in the crowd. Nice. And there was a, a couple who had listened to all of the episodes. So then they signed up to Patreon so they could listen to all the the I'm a Wizard ones while they were driving. To New York. So thanks. Thanks for saying yeah. hi. That was lovely. It was nice to meet a bunch of you. Mm. So that was really cool. We had, yeah, we had a great time. We had a good time. We played a lot of darts. So, <laughs> oh my goodness. So Matt was filming a video for his YouTubes. And in, in the place where... You, I don't want to give away what the video is. Oh, no, we can about. do that. Yeah, oh, we can so do that. For listeners who are unfamiliar with this, uh, I make a lot of YouTube videos about mathematics. <laughs> yep. And there's a guy called Rolly Williams who has one channel about playing pool. Mm-hmm. He's, he, he's branded as the average pool player and he tries to recreate famous shots in pool to see how long it takes an average player to do what the pros do yeah. on the first go. He's also got a climate change channel called Climate Town, which is very good. Yes. Yeah, it is. But I was filming a math, because we're in the States, a math of pool video uh, at Skyline Bar and Billiards. I think that's the official name. It's, it, it's in Brooklyn. Bar. Billions Bar. Mm. It's a very cool bar. If you're there, go play some pool. But you did not play pool. No, because you guys were filming and then there was a lot of other people, you know, practicing their pool. pool hall. Yeah. Yeah. So, but there was a darts board. There was. No one was playing darts. So I was like, oh, I'll just, I'll just brush up on some of my dart skills while you guys play pool. And uh, got into one of my uh, (laughs) hyper-focus. You did. You did. Modes. And for two and a half hours. A little way in, I was like, I wonder what Beck's up to. I was like, so you're playing darts? I'm like, oh, that'll entertain her for Non-stop. several Didn't hours. Didn't eat, didn't yeah. go to the toilet, nah. just throwing darts, collecting them, throwing them again. But managed to improve my yeah. stance, got like much better at my aim. I got quite a few bullseyes actually over the two and a half hours. But you couldn't even celebrate loudly because we were filming. No, oh yeah. Far from you. yeah. And it was a bit, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, right. This, we will put it on socials. You took a photo? I took a photo and a Evidence. little video yep. where you guys were filming, like you were doing a little talky bit where you're going over the maths. Yep. And That's what um, I do, man. you were chatting, and I'd already gotten a dart in the center, 
Bullseye. And I was using up like my final dart. Yep. And then I got one in the back of the, the dart. The bullseye dart. Yeah. I was so close to going, oh! No, I bet you were. And oh, then yeah. I knew that I couldn't. We did play darts with you afterwards once we'd wrapped. Yeah, I know. After two and a half hours of that. Yeah. We were then like, okay, let's play some darts. I thought you were going to hustle us. I did okay. You did good. You did good. I, I, came, I, I came second. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, in that we stopped after you won. <laughs> oh, right. Wow. But but I was just behind you. Right behind. Yeah. And to paint the full picture, it was yourself, myself, uh, Grant Sanderson from the Three Blue One Brown YouTube channel. Yes. Who has done a video about darts on the Number File channel. Just uh. Oh, okay. Link it all together. And Rolly. And, and Rolly. And Jen. And Jen. Who was the professional? Billiard She's player. so good at pool. She's so good. Just ridiculous. Yeah. Jennifer Beretta. People want to look her up. Incredible pool player. Yeah. Amazing. Would you set, 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 set like a challenging shot up on the table and be like, you got to bounce the ball off this cushion, off that cushion, hit another ball in the pocket and she would just do it. Oh, and I also, since I got back, I've uh, got another podcast. It's only five episodes though. So you don't have to stress Matt. It's okay. But it's, I've made, I've made peace with you. Um, it's on BBC Sounds. It's already out. It's called Elon Musk versus Twitter. Yeah. It's all about the Elon Musk. You know, Twitter the deal right thing. There. Interestingly, by the time this episode comes out, I there might be more episodes coming out depending on the outcome of what's oh, happening. Wow. Because like he was going to buy Twitter and then he wasn't. And then he wasn't. And then was they were going to go to court. But then he said he was going to buy it and then they cancelled the court case. Oh my gosh, so much drama. So I'm excited to know by the time this comes out if we know what's happened. What about you, Matt? Oh my goodness. Well, uh, we both left New York at the same time. I stayed in the States. I uh, drove around with Alex, who holds the camera and does editing. And we filmed two videos in New York. We filmed an additional four videos across multiple states. And on the very last night, when we were halfway through the final video, because we filmed the last video in two locations in Florida, we were staying in Tallahassee. And like the final day, we had to get up, drive three hours to Orlando, film the final shots. And then get to the airport in time for like a 5 p.m. flight. It was like ridiculous. Mm. So it was manic. But on the last night, we found a bar in Tallahassee that did food and had a dartboard. Oh. And, so, and so we ended the trip the way it kind of started. Did you both use the stance that I taught you? We did. Yay! I absolutely used the stance that you taught. And, and I was excited because you, you, were, you were throwing... The way that I was throwing when I started, and All then over the I'd shop. looked up dangerous the correct stance yep. and and practiced that. It enhanced my game instantly. It took me ages to do it, whereas I was like, "Oh, you're supposed to stand like this," but you know it might be weird. And then you were like, "Bam, straight." But you, but yeah, you, that's because you you put the hard work in coach. honing honing. <laughs> you you could convey all that experience to me in a sentence or two. Yeah, we played pool first. We mm. like recreated the evening, and then once we finished playing pool, we then played darts, traditional order. Except it wasn't your standard dartboard. It was a modern electronic one. Oh, yeah. That would do the arithmetic for you. Initially, I was like, oh, like I quite enjoy doing doing the calculations. Yeah. Doing the arithmetic. But actually, you know, after a while, I was like, oh, my God, this is great. Because I'd just done like, what, two weeks straight of yeah. mass videos and maths and all sorts yeah. of stuff. And to actually have an evening off just throwing pointy things at a board. Yeah. And then not having to do any adding up. Mm-hmm. It's an unfamiliar sensation, but I was quite happy not doing any maths. So they were. So we ended we ended the trip where we started playing one, pool, playing darts. One thing I do have to quickly add is mm-hmm. that Grant Sanderson. Yep, from Three Blue One Brown. Yeah. Very good maths YouTube channel for people who are unfamiliar. Yeah. There was a wonderful moment when we were playing darts when he you know, pretended to be annoyed that he wasn't winning. He wasn't winning. Yeah. yeah which he wasn't. Oh, he's he wasn't delightful. Winning. But he was like, oh, this game is stupid. And then he threw the dart from where we were sitting, which yeah, was, it was like, like a table with a, food and drinks. It was like one and a half board. times the regulation line. Yeah. And then he like went, oh, and like threw it really hard and hit the connection point that connected the light the that light was lighting up the, the dartboard, board. Yeah. like on this little wire and so it just went poof didn't and the break light it. went out. Didn't but break it. It, it, it was like, it was like a plug. It. it disconnected the lights yeah. safely. And it wasn't like a huge, it's not a no. small bit. Yeah. And obviously he didn't mean to hit it, but it looked awesome. It was very funny. He threw it in the whole, the dark. It was like, it's like that's dark. stupid. And then just ah, turned off turned the light off, with a dart. Turned it off from across the room. Yeah. <laughs> if he then thrown another dart right across the bar and turned off the main lights. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that's how he turns off all lights now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just throws darts. <laughs> <laughs> it goes through so many light bulbs. <laughs> oh, 
Our first problem, Beck, comes from Sarah, who went to the problem posing page at a problem squared. Dot com mm. and says, Beck, oh, they've already pre-selected who they want to solve their problem. Oh, now you know how it feels. Uh. When I scroll, when, genuinely, when yeah. I scroll through all the problems, all the problems that we've yeah. been sent, I basically look for if they are addressed Matt, yeah. which a lot of them are. You like I'm like, yeah, no, nah, this is Gone. this is not for me. Yeah. And and rightfully so. They they usually are not things that I could answer. Not my specialty. Sarah says, Beck. Bookshelves are kind of boring. Mm. What creative and different ways can I store my books? They then point out they already sort their books by type and then genre, not theme, and then series. And they then say, sorry, Matt, not alphabetically. I don't know why they're apologizing for that. Fine. (laughs) Thank you, Sarah. Uh, They reckon they've got a few hundred books, roughly. They've not counted them exactly. And they're currently all in neat rows on regular bookshelves. And it's just not fun enough. And so their problem for you, Beck. What is the most interesting way to store books? Mm, I love this. I love this problem. Wait, is not type, genre, and theme the same thing? <laughs> theme's different to genre because you could have like a bunch of fantasy books, but they explore different themes. Okay. So you don't put like all the books that explore the finite nature of existence together. Right. And then all the books which explore the futility of an indifferent universe together. Yeah, cool. <laughs> what about type? Type. Is it fiction or non-fiction? That, that, that's what font they Picture use. Picture or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you sort your books, Matt? Not by typeface, but now, now I now really want should. to. All the yeah. serifs are on one side. <laughs> uh, mine are unordered with the exception of the bookcase in my study. That's often in the background when I film. I mm. put all my maths books together. And actually, Lucy's physics books are all together. But everything else is... No order whatsoever. Now that I know this, I'm going to try and sneak different books onto that bookshelf to be in the background. That'd of your be very videos. funny if you can yeah. sneak a. So it changes book each time. You I can always be, tell if I. Well, visited. the reason I do that is I need to be careful because I buy books for several reasons. One of which I think the title and/or cover is hilarious. Yeah. But stripped of that context, there's some weird books in my book collection. Next time you're at my place, yeah, you can find the weirdest book. Okay. In my collection. All right. And uh, we'll put that in. A future episode. Okay, done. What do you do? I'm not one of those people who orders them exactly by size. Gav orders them by size in his bookshelf. Oh, what? Descending? No, he tries to get all of the shelves to be where the books are the equal height as much as possible. Oh. So you just get this nice Nice straight line. Oh, that's... Yeah. And it does mean on a couple of shelves, he sort of does it symmetrically. So if there's a couple of larger books, then he'll have them on the far ends on each side. So that all sort of evens out in the middle. Yeah. It is quite nice to look at. That's something. My sister-in-law does it by color spectrum. Yeah, I see there's a lot. I've got a lot of friends that do that yeah. now because ever since old Pinterest. And what do you do? So I've got a lot of kids' books and picture books for um, reference. I know you're starting to smile, but it is <laughs> I'm like... I'm smirking. <laughs> a lot of them are either books from my childhood that are quite inspirational and I still refer to for stuff. Like I've got Goblins by Brian Froud, which is one of my favorites. He, he was the designer on like Labyrinth. Um, oh. Yeah, did a lot of Jim Henson stuff. Mm. So, and that's a pop-up book which obviously had a really big impact on me. For, any, for those of you who haven't seen me as a performer, as a stand-up, I use um, flip charts with like pop-up type tech. elements. Yeah. yeah. So I've got that and a few other books on pop-up and different things like that. Because those books are usually quite large, it's like whatever shelves are large enough to hold them. Do you uh, ever have to cull your book collection? I know that I could be a bit basic, <laughs> <Yes>. but <laughs> do you ever have to colour in you your books? them all in because <laughs> <laughs> Shots fired. No, I haven't had to cull Oof. my book collection because I don't have a very big book collection. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, my mum, was, my mum is still a librarian. So a lot of the books oh. that I read as a kid were borrowed. That's easy. Yeah. So I don't actually have a massive book collection. I have to routinely thin the herd. Yeah, I know. Your house is filled with too books. Too many, too many. You've got like bookshelves in your hall, like, actually, in, like upstairs in the landing. Yeah. Now we'll get back to Sarah's problem. I think this is very interesting. I love this problem. But if I was posing it, it wouldn't be what are different ways to store books. It would be how to make bookshelves interesting. Because Cause you put you put like action figures and stuff on them. Yeah, my bookshelves have got all like yeah. it'll be broken up with, you know, action figures or photos or got a camera. So I'll do that. But, all, you know, I've always wanted to have a door 
that is a bookshelf. Oh, a secret door. Yeah, I've always wanted to have a secret oh, door. I'd love to have a secret door. So I was thinking about this and I was like, right, so we're assuming that maybe you don't need immediate access to them. Yeah. In which case, and this is something that I have accidentally done in the past, stacking books is a bit like building blocks. Yep. Which means that you could technically store your books in the shape of any type of thing. Yeah, if you can build it. Um, and I've got structural concerns. <laughs> like, are the books just free stacked or are they in some kind of... No, free stacked. Frame? Free stacked. But just- you'd have to have pretty sturdy books. Ah. So, for instance, if you need a chair, you could build a chair out of stacked books. Really? In fact, I, there, there, some people have already done it. Wouldn't be good I, I looked support. it up. I'm not the only person to have this thought. Some people have done it and they've done it very well. Oh. I think that's the most interesting way is to make furniture. Like, you could build a bed... And then you put your mattress on top of it. Oh, I always wanted to make a bookcase out of books. Okay. <laughs> so you'd like stack books and then have a shelf. And then stack <laughs> books and then have a shelf. Uh, and then you put the books on the shelves. Oh, that'd be very funny. You could even somehow reinforce books to become the shelves. I like that. Yeah. You could build some really nice accent columns yeah. in your house to like frame your, your doorways. Well, I don't know if you've spotted this. We'll have a look when we get back to my place. Mm. I've got a tower of books on either side of the doorway to my study. I've never noticed that. They just start stacking from the ground up. They're both maybe waist high. Oh, high. no. Yeah, I have seen that. I do hilariously keep books on the top, which have titles that relate to mess. I've oh, messy, I never picked up on messy that. Messy by Tim Harford on one side. Yes. And Hot Mess by Matt Winning on the other. And so I think it's very funny because my study is frequently a state. Yeah, that's nice. So I take it back. I, I have organized my book placement yeah. for comedy purposes. The, the, what you run up against here, though, is people have very strong opinions in different directions on this. Mm. Things that would damage the books. Mm. Because stacking books is not good for them. No. I did a YouTube video ages ago where I was using books, copies of my own book, mm. as like a test mass to weigh something. And to be more accurate, I was cutting down to fractions of a book. Right. People in the comments got very upset. Yeah. That I was destroying. At the idea of, yeah. yeah. But I was destroying one of many, many copies of my own book. But those copies are worth something. You know, like people, but I've bought one. I bought mine like an idiot. I know. Could have asked you for one of your many, many free ones. Help yourself. There's several behind you in different languages. Well, let's just rub that in for the listeners then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but people, I mean, I think the entertainment value of the video and the educational thing of destroying a book i thought it was absolutely worth it i didn't have any qualms doing it but people yeah very very angry yeah and again as the child of a librarian i i get it that said, that's upsetting i would never dog ear like i would never fold over the yeah edge. i wouldn't i couldn't do that i can't write in a book that would make me very like i write yeah. like a name or something on the on the inside cover, cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah i do that yeah do you remember my storage solution idea no what was that i called you up because i was so excited about this idea uh, now, Th- that could be a lot of different occasions. If any listeners could actually help me implement this, then please do get in touch. But I, th- I think it's one of those, it's one of those things where I'd have to quit everything that I do and spend a hundred percent of my time building a business. Yeah, to hyper focus on this. Yeah. But basically, as a renter, I know that if I move house or flat or whatever, or move back to Australia, I'm going to have to pack up everything. Yeah. And oh, so to move bookshelves, Ugh. you have oh, to take everything out take of the bookshelf and then you move. move it. What if you made like really useful boxes or, or other storage, yep. you know, company boxes? Other boxes of different levels of usefulness are available. Yes. And you made them so they were like perfectly shaped as like a bookshelf size. Oh, I do remember this phone so call. So you put all the books in there with the spines so that they're sitting up in the way of a shelf and then stack those. And then when you're moving or something, you've just got a little lid you put the lids back click on, on yep. and then you, you know, turn it. And then you can stack them and stick them in there. Like a flight case for life. What are these boxes? The configurations. What are these boxes called? Beck boxes. Beck boxes. So, you know, Sarah, that's once I've got that business going. Oh, really? Oh, A you, creative you, way of you're storing your books. Organically marketing a non-existent business. Would be to use my storage boxes. Wow. And do you know what? I'll, as one of the options, I'll, I'll chuck in a storage door. <laughs> a free door. Yeah. That you can like slide open a panel and or like open up a... Well, it's not a real door, is it? It looks like a looks door. It looks like a door, but it's not a real but door. But it's just got it's some more books. Books. Yep. Yeah. No, we'll have that on the website on the website that I have for Box Hill. I think having side by side a bookcase, looks like a bookcase, but is a secret door. 
And it looks like a door, but it's a secret <laughs> case. I mean, come so on, confused. it's so good. <laughs> and you're like, here, follow me to the yeah, kitchen. Exactly, what? <laughs> <laughs> but do you think I've answered it? I think you have. But I think it's going to be down to Sarah to ding this one. Oh, I okay. Don't, I, don't, I, I feel like uh, I'm too close to the issue. I, yeah. want, I want to hear from Sarah. And if there's anyone listening who, you know, you've come up with an, inter- an interesting, a creative way of storing your books. Yeah. And I mean, like, create, you know, it has to be something that's that's interesting. It's worth mentioning that people will be fascinated by. We get some good suggestions. Then, oh, no, I'd like to see. I want to see pictures. You'll see if pictures. anyone or has diagrams. any interesting ways. Oh, okay. Or yeah. diagrams. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll yeah, accept yeah. diagrams. Either realized or conceptual. Yeah. On, uh, on Twitter, at a problem squared, send your pictures and diagrams. I'm not going to take text responses. No, I want pictures. Or pictures and diagrams. Yeah, just like my books. And in the future, mostly episode, pictures. We'll do any other bookcases. Nice. All right. Our dinglet slash wing, web, wing ding. Yep. Right. Min, hang min, on. Mini problem. Is from Pascal. 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 And Pascal says, usually lottery maths videos are hung up on the likelihood to win the jackpot. And don't go into detail about the chances of smaller consecutive winnings. Oh, yeah. If you were to buy a lottery ticket once a week for 30 years, what are the overall odds of coming out with a net positive positive? And how often would you need to win any of the smaller winnings? Right. Yep. Yeah. And then they say, lots of love from Germany. (laughs) Oh, thanks, Pascal. Yeah. Uh, It's a good point. And I've done stuff about the lottery and everyone just talks about the main jackpot Mm. of like in the UK, winning the main lottery prize is like one in 45 million. Right. And actually quite a lot. Yeah. And because um, Pascal says lots of love from Germany, I looked up the German main lottery lottery they've got yeah. other kind of raffly stuff that happens as well their main prize is one in about 140 million wow that's way worse yeah that's they're... like three and a half times worse so if you live in germany buy your lottery tickets in britain yeah it's up it's up there with like euro millions those kind of odds they're not they're do you not think that's odds. do you think that's because every now and then the number no comes up they're like there's no number no number because nine. nine yeah good work thank you <laughs> So that's my German joke all, done. We've all won a prize today. So uh, <laughs> I've written you. So what I did was, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. But first of all, I want to set it running. I've written a German lottery simulator in, <laughs> of course in you code. Have. And it will get a bunch of people who will all play the lottery for 30 years and then return how well they did. So how many people would you like to set playing the lottery here? Oh, well, how, I mean, how many do you think we need in order for it to well, do its job properly? It, well, it, that's interesting because the more people you have, the longer it takes. All right. Is this going to be like your it's, it's not be, so, sorry, wordle? Uh, have you got 32 days? No. <laughs> so, and someone's like, well, I can do it in under... Points. Under, it's now under half, under half a millisecond now. Uh, I love this. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so annoyed. Okay. So, okay. We'll do a thousand people. That's near instant. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thousand, can we thousand, name them all? That, you can name them all. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Start and run. Okay. Keith. Done. So. Spencer. So the Joanne. average... The average earning Keith again for all the Keiths <laughs> and one Joanne <laughs> was people won back twenty five point three percent of the money they spent on the tickets. Okay, and of the people who ended up making a profit, two and a half percent. Ah, so let's bump it up. I know, I know a million takes forever, so I'm going to do a hundred thousand people at once, mm-hmm. and we'll set that going. So what I've done because I've done so much on the UK lottery, yeah. I thought for Pascal, I'll get all the stats for the German lottery. Mm. <laughs> so the German lottery, you win percentages of the total prize pool for different numbers that match. So I found a website that gave the breakdown of both the odds for each possible result mm. and the average winnings people get for that result. Okay, yeah. And so I, to be honest, I didn't do that, that math myself. I found a website that had done it and I've trusted them. So there you are. All right. So this, which is your nice way of saying Look, if it's wrong, it's not my fault. Yeah, basically. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. And actually, what, what I found very interesting is normally the more unlikely the outcome, the more money you win for it. Ah. So the more common responses... Yeah, that makes sense. You, ...you make less money. But the last two are the other way around. So getting three numbers correct in the German lottery is a one in 63 chance, and you win on average 11 euros and 10 euro cent. Okay. It's actually less likely to get two numbers and the super number... 
Oh. Less likely, but you only get six euros. Huh. And that's because the six euro one is a guaranteed six euros, whereas mm. the other one's a percentage payout based on all the other winnings, but it's averaged out at more money despite being higher odds. Wow. Which I thought was super, super intriguing. That is interesting. Yeah. So I coded the whole thing up. And so people play it 52 times a year for 30 years. Yeah. Across her. And uh, let's have a look. Are they still going? They're still running. So 100,000 people are still playing it mm -hmm. uh, to get the results. Now, in the UK, you can just look up the average return. What? So currently, the UK government hands out the license to run the lottery to a company. Yeah. And actually, it's changing. New companies taking it over. In 2024, so... As in the government sold that right? Yeah, the government has awarded the contract to a different company to run it. To run the rights to running a lottery? No, to run the lottery. Oh, right. So the actual doing of the lottery is run by a private company called Camelot Runner at the moment. Oh, yes, yeah. And they are allowed to keep 1% of all the money spent on tickets. All oh, the people have finished playing the lottery. They're allowed to keep 1% of the money as profit. Yeah. They keep 4% of it on running costs. Okay, yep. So that's like 5% yeah. their turnover of which 1% is profit. And then they're mandated on how much has to go to charity, how much has to go out as prizes. And at the moment, 53% of money people spend on tickets is given back as prizes. Oh, okay. So yeah, so that's like part, it's actually part of the law is that yeah. they have to. Yeah. And then what's, what's happening with the changeover? What's about to change? A new, a new company's got the contract to run the lottery. Arwen are taking over the contract. And they can they can Wait, change. How's that spelt? A L L W Y N. Oh, so it's almost like all win. All win. Like we all, all win. win. We all win. But when then, Al wins. when people like we have an all one, we have an all like, one. Uh, Very few people it's win. It's spelled in fact. with a Y <laughs> <laughs> for important legal reasons. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Fruit Loops. Yes, yeah, exactly. So uh, <laughs> they'll be taking over, and they think that at the moment they're saying they're going to reduce the cost of buying tickets, and they're going to have more draws. Like two draws per night instead of one. Maybe that's what they know because then they'll be like, oh, people will buy uh, tickets for both buy, draws. Because you, you have to. So they're going to half the price but double the draws. Yeah. Now, what I was about to say before is that tells us that on average, for every pound you spend on the lottery, you get 53p in winnings. Yeah. And actually, Pascal's thing of people play it for a long time, the longer you play it, the more you're going to average out at that 53p return. Yeah. So you might long, end long up run. half poorer. Yeah. But half of that time has been spent having some lovely fantasies. Exactly. <laughs> it's a permission to do it. And that's better value than the money you get back. But sure. But it's not a good investment. But that's a bit skewed because that average, that 53% in the UK, also includes the jackpots, which are incredibly unlikely. Mm. And now I couldn't find the official regulations for Germany. I don't speak German. But I could mm. run this simulation. Yeah. And this is interesting because this is there's only 100,000 people. Yeah. Playing for 30 years each. All right. How's Joanne done? It's very mm -hmm. unlikely they're going to win the jackpot. So this mm. is most people's experience. And they got back on average 37.7% this time. Wow. I ran it a bunch of times. It bounces around between 30 and 40%. Mm. You probably and so it's still it higher than it was originally. Originally, it was about a quarter. It was yeah. Like about yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost but, but We only did 1,000 people then, so we were going to get wild fluctuations. But yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's in that up. ballpark. Yeah. So I ran the actual expected return on the German lottery with the numbers I found. Mm. And it came out, my calculations based on numbers I found online, it was like 49.99%. Right. So I can almost guarantee, knowing Germany, it's exactly 50%. Yeah. Because yeah. that makes logical sense. Mm-hmm. 50% is prize, 50% is everything else. Yeah. So that's the long term. If But you need to live long enough to win the jackpot to do that. Oh, and again, it came out at uh, only 2.5% of people made a profit over 30 years. Hmm. So to answer one of Pascal's problems, if you ignore the jackpots, because no one's winning them anyway, and yeah. you look at the smaller prizes, only 2.5% of people make money over 30 years. Yeah. Everyone else loses money. Mm -hmm. But we forget. We forget how much we're spending because it's €1.20 per ticket. People forget how much that adds up. Yeah. And they over the short term, like, oh, I'm making money because they win a couple of prizes yeah. together. But nah. So actually, I wrote another bit of code to actually see how long it would take to win the German lottery. Mm. So I'm going to run that now. Here we go. So this is, this, is, uh, this is you playing the German lottery, Beck. Okay. Just so me on my own. Just you on your own. Just one person. And I'm buying a ticket a week. Ticket a week. Yeah. Starting now. Ready? Yeah. And Go. Okay, so it's now running yeah. with you buying one ticket a week. And obviously, we're not taking into account inflation or anything like no. that. Like no, no, no. The no, ticket's no. going to stay at 120 Because I'm doing everything as kind of as ratios 
Rather so than ev- everything's amounts. in 2022 euros. Mm-hmm. So uh, we don't have to worry about it escalating up. And so the idea here is we'll get a sense of how long it would take you to win the jackpot. Mm-hmm. But it's also keeping track of how many smaller prizes you're winning. Oh, so that's once nice. you win the jackpot, it'll be able to tell you the accumulative total of everything else you won. Mm-hmm. And it's tracking how much you're spending on it. So it's this is really cool. The one they should Euro have 20. this in school. It's good. It's good educational. Actually, coding it up was really interesting. So it's a good little exercise in thinking through the probability and everything and then getting, yeah. get, getting some code to run. Well, you came in. I, this is the code I was writing when you were when I was talking about recording Elon. Your, other, your other podcast. I know. How rude am I? I came know. in and was like, I'm going to use our equipment to record the other thing. The, yeah, your sidecast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can I say? They paid me. <laughs> oh, okay. we're done. <gasps> All right, enough. You won the jackpot. <gasps> Yay! How so, old am I? Okay, you won the Are jackpot. Are you going to add it to my age now? I'm you... about to turn 36. Oh, okay. Okay, interesting. You won the jackpot. Let me just... Uh, uh, 13 weeks into the year 4,890,677. Uh, and given... Uh, and how old, are you, how old are you now, Beck? I'm a, well, 35. 35. Yeah. You will be 4,890,712. <laughs> and then Rhino Room finally gets a permanent venue. Yep. yep. Now, there's good news. So you won the jackpot and the jackpot you won is just over 12 and a half million euros. Because you've, you've won the main prize on the German okay. lottery. Well, it's not a huge amount. Now, along the way, you won a lot of smaller prizes and they total more. They're just over 77 and a half million. Wow. That's a big amount more. Yeah. So you actually made over 90 million euros across all your small prizes and then the big jackpot by the time you won the jackpot. Huh. 90 million euros. Now, bad news. It costs you 305 million euros in tickets. <laughs> so you made a loss of 214, wow. 215 million euros. Right. So I'm probably not You're in a position. way in debt. Yeah, I've made about a third of what I lost. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Give it. Yeah. Just under yeah. that. Yeah. Does that work out with the percentage? Then you know how you're looking at the percentage of. Oh yeah, the the percentage from before though, no one was winning the jackpot, but actually the jackpot is not that big compared to what you yeah. win the smaller prizes. So actually, shall we just? I'll very quickly run your numbers. So there's there's the three hundred and five million it cost you to play. Here's the 90 million you won. So your percentage, including the jackpot, and actually this would be quite a nice representative answer. Uh, yeah, 29.56%, about 30%. Yeah. Yeah. And the other one was like somewhere between... Well, 30 and 40, on, yeah. When you ran it with 1,000, it was like 24. 25. Per, 20, yeah. yeah, roughly 25. And then when you ran it with 100,000, it was 30-something. Yeah. If I, I'll, I'll run it again with 10,000 now. 10,000 is running... Oh, someone must have won the jackpot. Oh. Yeah. Still only 2.5% of people made money, mm-hmm. but the average winnings was uh, 1.04. 1.04. Yeah, times times the original spend. What you're saying is um, if your plan... <laughs> if your plan is to make money on the lottery... Yeah. No. Even... And this is interesting. Pascal's got a very important point. And this is the German lottery. This is the German lottery. running it with It's those very stats. similar to every other lottery. Like, it's yeah. just... The, the, it's the minor details of the exact numbers, mm-hmm. but the overall the size of and types, the probability of numbers are all the same. Mm. And Pascal's got a very interesting point that we always ignore the smaller prizes. Those of us who do yeah. videos and podcasts about this maths. And actually, as we saw when you played it, for millions of years, <laughs> you made more money on the smaller prizes than that one jackpot you got eventually. Yeah. And we use the term made. But even then, <laughs> Carefully. you didn't make money. No. Even factoring in, very important, the small prizes, mm. still no good. But You're not going to make money in the lottery. But hey. Yeah. I mean, millions of chances to dream. Oh, there you are. You did a lot of dreaming. So much dreaming. You're also in a lot of debt. It's now time for AOB, which stands for El Bullseye. <laughs> <laughs> what have we got this time, Beck? Well, we had we had quite the response after your busted. Oh yeah, yeah. I thought I'd left no no stone left unturned on that one, but apparently 
Yeah, well, well, I mean, my favorite response, a lot of them was pe- were people coming up with their own theories and, and finish that. My favorite response was someone who was just angry because then they got 3,000 stuck in their head, like the year 3,000 stuck in their head for days afterwards. Yeah, for people who missed this episode, I analyzed the lyrics to the early 2000s song Year 3000 by Busted. Yes. Do you remember I was on the phone to you not that long afterwards when I just got to the US? You hadn't flown out yet. I was in Orlando. Yeah. I was going to the Electrical Transmission and Substation Structures Conference. And I was sat, like, I'd listened back to that episode. I was doing some work in my hotel room. And then I heard Year 3000 playing quietly in the background. Oh, yes. And yes. I was like, what? I was like, did I leave the podcast running? And no, it was being played outside the hotel in the pool area. Yeah. Weird. Did I mention on that episode how easily that song melds with Third Eye Blind? Semi charm kind of life, baby, no. baby. <laughs> Honestly, play them really? together. It's, oh. Yeah. And I don't think anyone's mixed it yet. Oh, there's a mashup so waiting it, to happen. Yeah. If there's any musically inclined people listening, I'd love to hear a mashup of Third Eye Blind, Semi charm kind of life. With? With yeah, Busted 3000. 3000. Busted. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But there was one response that we got out of all of the ones where people had like done their own maths and come up with their own solutions. Someone, I, someone called Alistair said their name rhymes better with flux capacitor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which, uh, do you know what? I, it's, it's better than Peter. Better than Peter. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll give that to you, are. Alistair. <laughs> <laughs> but the response I'm referring to came via the problem posing page, which is a problem squared.com. Yeah. They... We selected used the solution. Menu, went for solution. Yep. Now they didn't provide a name or anything, no, so I don't know on. who to uh, attribute this to. But they went into so much depth, and what I was really pleased with, because after we recorded that episode, I think I said to you, "Oh, we didn't talk about how you can free sperm." Yeah. Which, by the way, if this is out of context for anyone who hasn't listened to that episode yet, is very confusing. Real weird. Yeah, zero four three. If you haven't listened to it yet. That's the episode we talk about, Busted Song Year 3000. You know, this person mentioned that. Yeah, and they run the numbers. But they also looked into how long you can keep sperm frozen for. Because I didn't think of that. I like it could, it's, got a... it's 55 years, according to oh, this, years. this person. But one bit I just wanted to mention in, in particular was they said, with the mention of a flux capacitor, like the one in a film I've seen and drove around in a time machine, the song implies a time machine is similar to a DeLorean. Yes, and the video um, reinforces that. Yep. The most widely known fact about the DeLorean is that it needs to reach 88 miles per hour to initiate time travel. Yep. This is not possible underwater. Because oh. you remember, we're all underwater, as you mentioned. Well, we live underwater. We live underwater. I'm sure the video shows everyone in like a big dome or something. They're not like moving through water. Okay, maybe this solves it. Because then they said, after a quick Google search, this is faster than any known submarine and is about as fast as some torpedoes. That would be a problem if you went to the future and the car was underwater. Yeah. So they're like, how did Peter get back from the future? Also, you can't drive underwater, at least not in a conventional car. Peter would have had to have known that the future was underwater in advance to be able to sufficiently waterproof the car and add additional propulsion methods. Oh, like what this... Where we're going, we don't need roads. Yeah. So ah, uh, that's very funny. Yep. They've got, and then they go on to answer it as well. They bring up so many. It, look, it's uh, a really, it's dense. really, it's great though. And I, we don't have time to go through it all. We're not. So we're gonna do some screenshots of that answer. We'll put it up on yep. socials, on Instagram and Twitter, and you can you can see what these are. I haven't fact checked any of them, but it's pretty. They, they've gone pretty hardcore into it. Right. Yeah. Next up. We have an update on episode 042 where I talked about my code that found five words that between them had 25 distinct letters. And I did a little side tangent where I said that uh, people try to find two words that have the most distinct letters possible with no repeats. Mm. And people had previously found blacksmith and gunpowdery, two 10 letter words that between them have 20 distinct letters. And we found the new ones, show jumping and veldcraft. An 11 letter and a 9 letter word, which between them have 20 distinct letters with no repeats. And uh, you made a very foolish offer. Yes, I said if anyone can come up with two words that use all the letters in the alphabet, so 26 distinct letters between them, yep. then we would come up with meanings for them. Yeah. 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 And we got sent quite a few different options. Oh. But there was one... The, a lot of them, it was quite hard to pronounce or they're a little bit strange. Oh, if only we could have seen that coming. I know. 
This one came from someone called Drawings Are Sketchy. Right. He has given us two, but as I was trying to work out what my definitions of them would be, right. I actually realized that if I moved some of the letters around... Oh, you can improve on... I could slightly improve. Gotcha. So these are almost almost the same as the ones that Drawings Are Sketchy sent us. There's now a collaborative effort. Yeah. We've got Ved Farquing. Can I have that in a sentence? Well, I'll spell it first. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a V for Victor, E, D for Delta, P for phonetic alphabet, H, A, R, K, W, I, N for November, G. Right. In a sentence, please. I was looking up words that end in wing yep. that aren't verbs of words that end in W. Because often oh, words that end in W yeah. have a vowel beforehand. But oh. this one doesn't. I oh, know you're wowing and me. And you wouldn't have... But yeah, you've got yeah. your vowel beforehand. Yeah. So I was like, ooh, it couldn't be that. It needs to be a word that ends in wing that has a consonant before wing. Yep. And the only examples I could find were types of birds. Ah. And ved apparently means like quite close to a home. Right. So like if a road is like a, a ved road is like a road that's really close to a house. So I've decided that Ved Farkwing is a bird that gets way too close for comfort. Go oh, nice. It's like swooping you. It's yep. like that. Ah, yeah, very annoying. A that, Ved Farkwing. Magpies are real. Ved Farkwing. There you go. Yeah. And then the second word is, I'll spell it first. B for Bravo. U. M for Mike. O. Bum. L. S. Bum for holes. Sierra. C for Charlie. Q. U. Y T Z. Bumholes quitty. Bumhole squits is how you pronounce <laughs> that. Goal. Good to know. Bum-hole Good to squits. know. Can I hear that in a sentence? Yep. I've got a particularly bad case of <laughs> bumhole squits. <laughs> oh my. Oh. I don't know why I'm surprised. <laughs> so, um, if we can just start using those words so much, they become that worse. The dictionaries have to. Ved Farkwing <laughs> right. and bumhole squits. <laughs> Uh, as in, it's a real shame that bird came really close to me because clearly it's got a case of pummel squids. squids. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I will add to that in, in the vein of marginal gains, but we were emailed by Richard Broughton, who said maybe Veldcraft could just be Veldcrafty. Oh. You get an extra Y. 21 letters now. Oh, nice. Not the whole alphabet. A step in the right direction. Oh, that was the longest word, was it? We yeah, that, that's so. Show jumping, Veldcraft was the two that mm-hmm. we found, and so if we did show jumping, Veldcraft D with a Y on it, one more letter. Wow. Yeah, it's no bumble squits. Well, we did have someone who wrote in this is Nosser they said that they wanted to find the longest word that they could generate that sounded like an English word right but not necessarily a real word gotcha. using distinct letters yep uh, and so they they generated a list of the most common five grams excellent that occur at the start in the middle and at the end of a word then kept only the triplets with no recurring letter and looked Great. for the combination with the most common parts that being the word macro suadingly Oh, macro suadingly. Uh, which I said, that, which I suppose would describe the way in which a whole population would play pretend. That did go macro suadingly. It's nice. That's good. It's 15 letters. Ooh, 15. No need to rain on Nosser's parade, but there are already two 15 letter words that, all that are actual letters. words oh. with no repeating letters. And they are dermatoglyphics. Dermatoglyphics. And uncopyrightable. Uncopyrightable. Hmm. That's quite enjoyable, that one. That's a good one. Yeah. If anyone can find a plausible English-looking word... With 16 letters. With more than 15 distinct letters. We've like already we got can, so much in like the business. Like we can stop it. This is such a Sisyphean... Oh, like, we've got, like we can opt out. <laughs> Might as well start yeah. buying lottery tickets. <laughs> in conclusion, thank you all so much for listening to this episode. A particular thanks... To our Patreon supporters. Yes. Who, among their many perks for making this podcast possible, including the limited edition I'm a Wizard episodes. It's only limited in the number of people who can listen to it. 
They're yeah. very long. They're long. They're not limited. By they're, not, any. they're pretty. They're no. basically the same length as a standard they're, they're, podcast. They're, yeah, yeah, but they're way less structured. If you like this podcast, but without the learning <laughs> but stuff, think, oh, wouldn't it be great if it was more rambly? <laughs> <laughs> It's funny. But there are it is funny. There and are you, other You want to hear me suggesting that Matt's nude a lot. A lot. So much. Uh the other benefit is we pick three names completely at random to thank them at the end of each episode, which this time includes Hugo Baumer. Boomer. Stephen Edmondson. Shivi Sharma. Thank you all very much. I'm Matt Parker. You've also been listening to Beck Hill and our producer, who is someone who frequently shouts 180. <laughs> As in, I can't believe this recording is 180 minutes long. <laughs> it's Lauren Armstrong Carter. Thank you all very much. Post credits? Yeah. Do you have a thing for post credits? Beck, what do you mean? Have I got a thing for post credits? Oh, you left me with a challenge when I was in the states. I did because I it's left. In the cupboard. <gasps> I so while Matt goes to the cupboard, yeah. I left New York and realized that Matt and I never got our American version of Twisties, and so I, <laughs> I, I was like, Matt, you have to find it. Now, I will say, I did not find. The specific brand, Hawkins Cheesies. I've brought Cheetos Crunchy. Yes. Which has been mentioned before. Yes. As an option. The printed date is the 3rd of Jan, 2023. It's not that far not away. Not that far away, no. Yeah. All right. Ready? I'm opening yep. them. Go. Going for a smell? Yeah. Oh, okay. Huh? Yeah. They smell savory. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. They smell almost woody. Oh. Oh, I get woody. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. They do say made with real cheese. Oh, okay. But, you know, we've all seen Americans' version we'll see of what, what real cheese is. Cheese is. Yeah. Had yeah. all of that one right there. <laughs> mm. Do you know what? I just started eating. I didn't even. You just just chowing down. They're not Which twisties. Is testament to... no, not twisties. They're not dissimilar. Mm. You know how when we had the watsits, mm-hmm. the crunchy watsits, they're not as salty as twi- twisties. Are so salty. They're almost more muted. Twisties are so salty they will suck all of the moisture off your tongue. <laughs> like you'll get those little spots coming out in your tongue if you eat too mm-hmm. much. Well, hey, the search we, continues. Do we have a post a postal address for the podcast in case anyone wants to send us we do, we do. dots cheese curls? Yeah, yeah. Or what was the other one? Email back at a problem com. You can't email them to me. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll provide if you send a photographic evidence that you've got the snack, we'll give you the postal address. Okay. All right. Beck at a problem com. Do you want? No, don't, we won't limit it to America. Anything that's like twisties. Mm, yep. If you want to send them, these are good, man.